All right, very good. Thank you, Mr. Denfeld. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the February 2nd meeting of the Edina City Council. It is February 2nd, 2021. It is 7.01 p.m. This meeting is being held electronically to comply with the governor's Stay Safe Minnesota order and to ensure the safety of all residents and our staff. All members of the city council staff and presenters are participating from their homes or offices. Before we begin, and there's a few things I'd like to cover for those listening in and hoping to participate in portions of the meeting. The city is committed to continuing to receive and hear your input on matters. We've been collecting public input through voicemail on our engagement website, which is bettertogetheredina.org. It's important you all know that all public hearing comments are read before we take action. You do not need to submit the same feedback in another way. All, all communication is considered equally regardless of the way in which it was submitted. Tonight, there will be only one opportunity for you to call in to provide comment via phone, and that's during community comment. We don't have any public hearing matters this evening. So if you want to call in during the community comment portion of the agenda, remember that you'll be allowed to speak about anything that's not otherwise on tonight's agenda or is a matter scheduled for a future public hearing. I'll give you the uh, phone number now if you want to call in during community comment, and I'll do that again when we get to the community comment portion of the agenda. If you want to call in for community comment, it is 800-374-0221, and the conference ID is 767-8907. 767, excuse me, 767-6890, 767 You'll be given three minutes to speak. Our city manager, Scott Neal, will be doing the timing, and he'll let you know if you go over the three-minute mark so that you need to wrap up your comments. So thanks in advance. As we work to conduct this meeting online using different kinds of software and almost 20 people participating from different places to try to make sure that this production goes smoothly. We hope there won't be any issues, of course, but rest assured that if there are, we'll try to get them corrected as soon as we can. So with that, I will call the meeting to order, and I will request a roll call from our clerk, Sharon Allison. Roll call, please, Ms. Allison. Councilmember Anderson? Here. Councilmember Jackson? Councilmember Jackson, I didn't hear you. Did you hear me now? Yep. Well, I saw your lips moved. Here. Yeah. That's good <laughs> enough. <laughs> Councilmember Pierce? Here. Councilmember Staunton? Here. Mayor Hovland? Here. Uh, next is the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I will rise. I think my mic will be the only one turned on during the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a form of agenda in front of us this evening. Is there anyone on the council or the staff, or city manager that wishes to amend the agenda in any form or fashion? No. Hearing nothing, is there a motion to approve the meeting agenda as shown? So moved. Second. We had a motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Staunton to approve the meeting agenda as shown. Any further discussion? Roll call, please, with respect to the adoption of the meeting agenda, Clerk Allison. Councilmember Jackson? Aye. Councilmember Pierce? Aye. Councilmember Staunton? Aye. Councilmember Anderson? Aye. Mayor Hovland? Aye. The uh, agenda is adopted as shown. And the next thing on our agenda is community comment. And, of course, uh, we're now going to hear from any residents who would like to speak about something uh, with the council that's not on tonight's agenda or scheduled for a future public hearing. Remember again to participate in community comment. You want to call 800-374-0221. The conference ID number again, 767-6890, 767-6890. Um, Director Benarat, do we have anybody in the queue that wishes to speak to the council? Good evening, Mayor Hovland, members of the council. Unfortunately, we don't have anyone on the call, and it does not appear anyone is dialing in. However, because there is a slight delay in the broadcast, I would recommend we wait a minute or so before moving Thank you, Director Benarat. Just 
at 706, so I will come back to you at 707 or when I have a caller, whichever is first. Thank you. It is now 7.07 .07 and I still don't have anyone on the line, so I think it's safe for you to move forward with your agenda. All right, thank you very much. Um, we customarily have the uh, city manager respond to community comments that were made two weeks ago. I think we had one uh, caller regarding the uh, fire stations, as, as I best recall. And Manager Neal, I don't know if you have uh, that same recollection. Uh, but I'll turn it over to you for uh, your response to any community comments from our last um, city council meeting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. That is my recollection, and it's uh, it's a discussion topic that comes up uh, frequently at uh, community comments. So I thought I would respond to it with a little more detail tonight. In in 2019, uh, the city engaged uh, five bugles designed to do a response time and and station location study for us and they and they did that state they did that study and we received it in January of 2019 so most of the data that they used uh, was 2000 in fact all the data they used was 2018 data uh, both in terms of the numbers of runs um, activity levels in the fire department but also traffic um, because traffic is a major concern uh, when you think about how long it takes to get an emergency service from a station to to a home where it's needed. This, uh, this study came back with uh, three key recommendations and I, I thought I would just share them tonight so that we're on the same uh, understanding and, and timeline. The most, I think, probably the most important statement in in this uh, study came on its page 19 which is where we have the con conclusions and recommendations and that is the Adina fire department is meeting their currently stated goal of responding to fire and ALS calls in an average time of eight minutes so that is our service uh, that's our service goal and we're meeting that goal we were meeting that goal in 2019 we're still meeting that goal today but there were three recommendations that came out of the study. One, uh, recommendation number one, keep existing station number one in its current location, which is, which is an important recommendation because that station is in very good shape. It's in a good spot um, for servicing the western half of, of, of the city. Re recommendation number two was construct a new station, a station number two number two, uh, we call it an up because we already have a station number two. So construct a new station number two near the southwest corner of the Southdale Center. So when this uh, recommendation was was shared with us, we it was based on uh, res a response time algorithm that took a look at uh, growth, where growth was occurring in the Southdale district, where growth was occurring uh, in northeast Edina as well. But really, uh, uh, it was the optimal spot based on growth patterns and traffic patterns at that time for it to be located, for to take our station to rebuild it, uh, not where it is right now over on Xerxes next to the, uh, on York, excuse me, next to the YMCA, but rebuild it uh, near the southwest uh, corner of Southdale Center. So somewhere in that general area, which is where we've been looking. Um, and, and that's where this idea came to build a fire station somewhere within the development of, of the 6600 block of France. So we're still working on that. And the construction of the new station uh, was recommended to be somewhere in the three to five year time period. So if you, if you understand that the, the study was from 2019, three to five years is that we should have uh, that fire station built uh, sometime between 2022 next year and 2024. 
So in terms of rebuilding our fire stations, our, our, our goal, our recommendation from our, uh, from our consultant is not to rebuild station number three, which is the one I'm gonna to talk to you next, but station number two, rebuild that station in the, in the short time frame. They, they also recommended based on community goal, uh, a new fire station. So of course we have two right now, they're recommending a third station and we'll call that station number three. Uh, and their recommendation was that that be in the northeast quadrant of the city, somewhere to the two to four acre range, somewhere in the area around City Hall is where they looked initially. So we're looking, we are still looking for sites for that. We've had some additional analysis done on three sites. Uh, one of those sites is adjacent to City Hall and the proposed site plan for the redevelopment of the Perkins area had an impact on that, both a positive and perhaps a negative impact on on that so we asked them to take a look at that site again but the time frame uh, that they recommended for us to have a new fire station built fire station 3 built was within five to ten years of of 2019 so that's the 2024 to 2029 so because they are 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 looking at that that distance uh, in terms of of when they did the study and when the fire station 3 is to be built we have been prioritizing most of our uh, time in looking at station number two because that's the one that has the most uh, current time frame on it. But we are at the same time looking at fire station three. Uh, they're both important, but in terms of priorities, we're working on station number two, the rebuild first, and, and then looking for a site for station number three. And, and those are the two time frames that we've been working within. Be happy to answer any questions on that if there are any. <clears throat> Questions with regard to the uh, report out by Manager Neal for comments? All right, very good. Uh, I think that was the singular inquiry, wasn't it, from the, from the yes, it was. meeting that's, before? That's all I have, that's right. All right, very good. Uh, next on the agenda is the uh, City Manager Performance Review. Uh, we've had some work being done the last, oh, the last month or so by Dr. Craig Waldron who's assisted us in this annual review. And we had our closed session uh, earlier during our work session, which we were allowed to do under Minnesota law to conduct that performance review. Uh, and I can, and, and we'll report out uh, on that performance review uh, from a public standpoint. Uh, and the, I would say that the city manager's performance during the past year has been judged to be uh, excellent by both uh, the city council and also by the, uh, uh, directors that work for Manager Neal internally. Uh, these uh, interviews are conducted uh, by Dr. Waldron. Uh, uh, topics explored include uh, leadership, uh, organizational culture, employee satisfaction, uh, communication, trust levels, uh, ethics and character, uh, the fact that it was an atypical year. Um, uh, and of course, um, we all recognize that from the beginning of the year when we started to deal with uh, things like uh, COVID and, uh, and probably in February, certainly in mid, by mid-March, uh, and then civil unrest in Minneapolis in June, uh, the election uh, challenges that we had, uh, so many things that took place this year. And I think both with respect to the council and uh, uh, the leadership team of Manager Neal, uh, they all deemed to be, they all deemed his performance to be outstanding. So uh, from a leadership standpoint, uh, he, he conducts himself in an exemplary way. Uh, that, of course, um, leads to a, a strong belief that uh, folks have trust in him. They trust his ethics. Uh, they trust his, uh, his civility. Uh, they trust uh, the uh, character that he has, uh, find that he has uh, very, very high uh, character and um, excellent on communications with his employees. Uh, an employee satisfaction rate that is outstanding. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Waldron found uh, a few places that he goes to where he conducts these kinds of uh, evaluations. Uh, does he find such a, a high regard for the city manager amongst the staff uh, all the way through uh, our employee corps? So he, uh, he defines Edina as clearly exemplary in its organization, uh, its council being forward thinking uh, an excellent staff led by a very, very capable city manager. So those are some of the 
the higher level findings that uh, that embody the determination that uh, Manager Neal's service during this prior year was 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 excellent. Um, as is our practice, uh, we look each year uh, with a small team. Uh, usually, the mayor and the mayor pro tem uh, meet with Manager Neal to discuss uh, his contract uh, and the renewal of the same, and any any changes we might want to make to that contract. And so I would recommend uh, that we continue that practice and that um, uh, I would entertain a motion that the mayor and the mayor pro tem be appointed as a subcommittee dealing with uh, compensation relative to the city manager and uh, extending the contract of the city manager under terms and conditions to be approved by the council. But allow the subcommittee to engage in the negotiations that would be a predicate to coming with a recommendation to the council. There so moved. So moved by Member Anderson. Second. Second by Member Jackson. Any further discussion with regard to the appointment of the uh, subcommittee to deal with the with Manager Neal's uh, contract? All right. Um, roll call, please, Miss Allison, Clerk Allison, with respect to the motion as stated. Council Member Pierce. Aye. Council Member Staunton. Aye. Council Member Anderson. Aye. Council Member Jackson. Aye. Mayor Hovlin. Aye. The motion passes and uh, Council Member Staunton and I will uh, meet and then we will also meet with the city manager and discuss his contract and bring some recommendations back to the city council. So thank you for that. And uh, next we have a consent agenda with a significant number of items on the consent agenda. Is there anyone on the uh, council that wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? I think, Member Jackson, you wanted to remove a couple items. I did. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to remove items 6C, E, and G. C, D. C as in Carolyn, E as in extra, and G as in good. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, anybody else wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? All right, hearing nothing. Is there a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda in a single motion with the exception of items 6, C, E, and G? So, so moved. Moved, moved by Member Pierce, second by Member Jackson. Any further discussion? Roll call, please, with respect to the motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of items C, E, and G. Council Member Staunton? Aye. Council Member Anderson? Aye. Council Member Jackson? Aye. Council Member Pierce? Aye. Mayor Hovland? Aye. Uh, those items are approved that are on the consent agenda with the exception of items C, E, and G. And back to Member Jackson with respect to. Uh, uh, item 6C, which is the proposed resolution 2021-16 supporting XL Energy's integrated resource plan. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to highlight this um, and, and let people know what was in this um, integrated resource plan. This is where Excel is moving to 100% carbon-free um, electricity generation by 2050. Um, they are going to close all of their coal plants by 2030 and um, the carbon free energy will be supported by the nuclear plants and also by two nat natural gas cycling plants, one in Becker and one in Mankato. So there will be um, reliable energy. Um, so when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing, we'll still have energy and uh, it looks like a really great plan and I wanted to just highlight how important that is to moving to a carbon uh, neutral stand in our energy use and because Excel is what serves the city of Edina and all of our residents. Thank you. Member Jackson, would you care to move that resolution which supports Excel Energy's integrated resource plan? I will move the resolution. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Pierce. A motion by Member Jackson. To adopt a resolution 2021-16, which supports Excel Energy's integrated resource plan. Any further discussion? Roll call, please, Clerk Allison. Councilmember Anderson. Aye. Councilmember Jackson. Aye. Councilmember Pierce. Aye. Councilmember Staunton. Aye. Mayor Hovland. Aye. 
Resolution 2021-16 is adopted. And then, Member Jackson, on to item 6E, which is a request for purchase for G benchmarking for 2021 through 23. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to highlight again the um, benchmarking ordinance that the city of Edina passed. Uh, we began with um, requiring businesses or buildings, uh, commercial and uh, apartment buildings that were 50,000 square feet and, and larger to participate in the benchmarking uh, energy benchmarking program. And now we're rolling it out to the 25,000 square foot buildings as well. Overlay consulting, which is what this item is, is available to help uh, building managers and building owners to figure out how to um, use this process. And it's a very uh, important part of the benchmarking ordinance because we want this to be successful for everybody involved. All right. Would you care to move that matter as well? I will move this matter as well. All right. Uh, Member Jackson moves this request for purchase of those services. Uh, to do the building uh, building benchmarking in 2021-2023. Is there a second? Second. Second from Member Staunton. Any further discussion? Roll call, please, with respect to the motion. Council Member Jackson. Aye. Council Member Pierce. Aye. Council Member Staunton. Aye. Council Member Anderson. Aye. Mayor Hovlin. Aye. The request for purchase uh, of vendor services from Overlay Consulting to do the building benchmarking uh, is approved. And next, Member Jackson, uh, was um, uh, it is 6G, this request for purchase involving City Hall Asset Management Energy Management Plan. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And with this, I did have a question for Mr. Milner. Um, I know the City Hall is already being benchmarked through the B3 process. And as we make these energy efficiency um, changes to City Hall, is there a plan to use benchmarking to show um, and to track how much energy savings we will um, get through this uh, improvement to the City Hall? Yeah, thanks, Member Jackson and members of the Council. The contract in front of you today is going to study City Hall and inventory where we could make some savings to the to the facility, lay out specific projects and what those savings could be in the future. Your reference to B3 since 2010, we have lots and lots of data for City Hall. We also are following that benchmarking ordinance you pulled earlier in the evening. So we have a lot of data, we just don't have a good way to tell the story. So as part of our climate action plan and what we're currently doing internally is trying to tell that story better, get that data organized and see not only the energy use, but also the cost to use that energy. And then look at the flexions in that data to see what did we do in 2018 where it starts to go up or down? What changes to operations? And start to measure and investigate those changes and see how we can continue to drop that energy use while also saving money in the process. Terrific. Thank you, Mr. Milner. So I will move the referral Request for purchase for City Hall Asset Management and Energy Management Plan. All right, is there a second? Second. Member Staunton seconds. Uh, the motion is to, is to support a request for purchase uh, uh, from HGA, Hamill Green, and Abrahamson. Uh, requested description of City Hall Asset Management and Energy Management Plan. And the, the basic notion is to review our assets and associated energy use and come up with some recommended improvements on energy uses. Uh, any further discussion with respect to the motion on 6G? All right, roll call please, Clerk Allison. Council Member Pierce. Aye. Council Member Staunton. Council Member Staunton. Aye. Council Member Anderson? Aye. Council Member Jackson? Aye. Mayor Hevlin? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, only one other thing that I wanted to uh, uh, bring to folks' attention was uh, as part of the consent agenda, we passed resolution 2021-18, uh, which accepts donations on behalf of the city of Edina, some really generous uh, donations uh, this reporting period. Uh, for the Arts Center, Kathleen Kane, uh, K-A-N-E, and her family, uh, $10,000 for general use at the Arts Center, which was an extraordinary gift. 
And then the Edina Garden Council, uh, what, a, what a wonderful organization that is. And to the Park and Rec Department, a, a contribution of $17,960 to help with uh, the construction of the Tranquility Garden Pergola that will be over at uh, Arneson Acres. So uh, our special thanks to the uh, Edina Garden Council and the Kathleen Kane family uh, for those generous donations to the city. All right. Um, next, we're on to special recognitions and presentations. And our city forester, Luther Overholt, has uh, a matter for us involving Owen Palmer, who's an AmeriCorps uh, member. And um, city forester Overholt, are you with us? I am here. Thank you, Mayor Hovland. And uh, so this is uh, long overdue. I'm here tonight to introduce uh, Owen Palmer. He is uh, the city's newest AmeriCorps member. And so I actually applied for a grant uh, this past summer and received it and Owen is part of the newest branch of uh, AmeriCorps programs. It's the Community Forestry Corps. And so he started this October and will be serving here at the city until August. Um, it's been invaluable having him so far. You know, I lose all my seasonal help in October and so he kind of stepped in at the right time and uh, he's been helping me a lot with our Emerald Ash Borer uh, management. I just got all the ash trees on city property inventoried last year with a grant from the county and so Owen's been helping me sort through that and uh, I'll let Owen uh, kind of introduce himself a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Palmer, welcome and, and uh, please introduce yourself and tell us how you're enjoying your work. Okay, yeah, sure I will. Um, yeah, so as Luther said, uh, my name is Owen. I am an AmeriCorps member. Um, I actually grew up in the city of Edina, so I went to Edina High School. I graduated in 2015. Um, after that, I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, where I graduated with a degree in economics and political science. And then after I graduated, I went and worked at Lando Lakes in supply chain logistics for a year. And I decided that I wanted to go to law school and I wanted to go to law school for um, environmental law. So I wanted to kind of switch gears from uh, supply chain and find something else that was maybe like a good stepping stone into environmental law. So I was looking for AmeriCorps opportunities and kind of just stumbled upon this one by chance. Um, the Community Forestry Corps, which is like Luther said, brand new this year. And I actually found it on a Facebook ad because I was looking up so many other AmeriCorps opportunities that I was getting targeted ads for their new uh, their new programs. And then I ended up applying and I've been working here since October, like you said, and I'm here through um, this August. And so far I've been loving it. Um, you know, in the winter it's like, it gets a little cold doing outside field work, but in the fall and summer, it was um, quite fun to be out and like planting, especially given the circumstances with COVID and everything. Well, you're getting a whole new view of your hometown from the yeah, type of work yeah, you're it's doing. Yeah, funny. Luther was talking about how he was glad that I grew up here because it just makes it easy when he needs me. He's like, go to a coaching park, and I just like know where that is. He doesn't have to like, <laughs> you know, show me or anything. I just know where to go. Well, uh, you must be doing a nice job because uh, our, uh, Mr. Overholt is giving you some nice compliments this evening. So uh, we're really pleased to have you back in Edina. I'm sure your experience at Madison was a, a, a really great one academically and, and socially yeah. as well. So yeah, you didn't convert to being a Packer fan, though, did you? <laughs> no, I did not. And All right. I'm probably going to go to the University of Minnesota for law school. So. Well, good. Uh, are you? Have you applied already? Yeah, I got in. Oh, you're up. You've been accepted. Sure, you're ready to go. Well, congratulations <laughs> on that too. That's a that's a terrific thing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, very very good. Um, anybody else have comments for Owen? All right, Mr. Palmer. Thanks so much for coming uh, to the meeting this evening, and uh, yeah, best of luck. 
when you start law school, and uh, we'll see you around uh, as weather gets nicer. See you somewhere. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thanks, and thanks, Mr. Thank Oval, for bringing Owen over this evening to meet us. Because the mayor is, after all, the weed inspector. So, so. <laughs> I, bet, uh, I bet Mr. Palmer didn't know that the mayor was the chief weed inspector. So, <laughs> so as the weather gets nicer, you'll be working with him. Yeah, we'll right, see him out there. Shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I don't remember who the assistant weed inspector is. If they resign, I'm really done in then. <laughs> he hasn't said he's going to come back this year, so yeah, you might be stuck with it. Oh, yeah. that, that is Tom Swenson. Uh, we'll keep him. Oh, all right. All right. Well, very good. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. Overholt, another Edina native, and Mr. Palmer. Good to see you this evening. Thank you. We don't have anything in the uh, public hearing portion of the agenda tonight, but we're going to move on now to our, so we're going to move on now to reports and recommendations. Uh, that portion of the agenda has uh, three matters for us to deal with this evening. And the first matter is uh, one that Director Milner has, which is the potential approval of a right-of-way easement uh, a vacation at 5932 Abbott Avenue South. And Director Milner, do you want to take us through that matter? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Member of the Council, at the last uh, Council meeting, I made a presentation on this uh, application to vacate five feet of a 10-foot uh, right-of-way easement along 5932 Abbott Avenue. We opened up the Better Together webpage to solicit comments, and we didn't have any comments provided by the deadline of noon of last Monday. So I would recommend the Council approve resolution number 2021-12 approving the right-of-way easement vacation at 5932 Abbott Avenue South. And I'd stand for any questions. All right, any questions for Director Milner on this matter? Would someone care to make a motion to adopt resolution 2021-12, which is uh, the vacation of the drainage and utility easement at 5932 Abbott Avenue South? So moved. We'll move. Member Anderson moves, Member Pierce seconds. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Kirk Allison, with respect to the motion as stated. Councilmember Staunton. Aye. Councilmember Anderson. Aye. Councilmember Jackson. Aye. Councilmember Pierce. Aye. Mayor Hufflin. Aye. Uh, resolution 2021 12, vacating the drainage and utility easement at 5932 Abbott Avenue South, is adopted. All right. Thank you. Uh, Director Miller, we appreciate you being here with us this evening. And then Director Teague has the next two matters in sequence here, which are a couple of sketch plan reviews. One for 4660 77th Street West, which is part of Pentagon Park, and then 4040 West 70th Street. And 4660 77th Street West is first. Director Teague. Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. As you know, with sketch plans, you're asked to provide non-binding feedback on a potential future redevelopment application. Uh, with this project, the applicant is proposing a five to six story apartment. Uh, there's 404 units. This is in the Pentagon Park area, Pentagon Park North. Um, before I bring on the applicant, just to give you a little history of some of the zoning and development requests that have happened on this site over the last oh, 10, 12 years. We've had a couple of rezonings or a couple of development proposals uh, that didn't move forward. Back in 2008, the site was rezoned to its current zoning of MDD6, which is a mixed development district. Uh, at that time, it was contemplated for residential housing on the north side of 77th in the Pentagon Park area. And then the Pentagon Park South site that eventually uh, is undergoing under some redevelopment was part of that project as well. It was anticipated for office uh, and a hotel. Those plans were provided in your packet. Uh, that project did not move forward in 2008, but we do have this overall development plan uh, that was approved as part of the rezoning and it did contemplate housing on this site. Um, as uh, some of the council recalls back in 2014 and 2017, we had another residential uh, request on the on this subject property that we're looking at, uh, but ultimately that planned unit development request uh, was denied. Uh, Mick Johnson has provided a review, our consultant for the Southdale uh, district. Generally, he's in uh, favorable of the projects. Um, 
with um, the recommendation that we improve some of those connections from 77 to the sidewalk uh, to the park area to the north. Uh, he believes in general providing residential uses within this area um, will add vibrancy to the neighborhood. So with that, I will introduce uh, Kurt Gunsbury of uh, Solon Properties. He will introduce the project and his project team and uh, give the council the details of the project. With that, I'll turn it over to Kurt. All right, thank you so much, Gary. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, welcome, Mr. Gunsbury. We can hear you just fine. Great. Thank you, Mayor Hovland. Um, well, good evening, council members and Mayor Hovland. Um, as Kerry said, I'm Kurt Gunsbury. I'm the owner of Solheim Companies. And we've built uh, over 2,000 apartments in the past 10 or so years. Uh, we develop, we manage, and we own the apartments, primarily in Minneapolis. This is actually our first project outside of the city of Minneapolis. Um, Jason, our vice president of development, is sharing some images of some of the uh, projects that we've done in the past, just to give you a little bit more entertainment than looking at me. Um, our, our brand promise is that we build beautiful, sustainable communities that people love. Um, we specialize in creating really memorable buildings that are typically on very complex locations where other developers have struggled. They may have environmental problems, they may have interaction with the street problems, they might otherwise have history that is uh, simply makes them undevelopable. Um, we've been partnering with BKB Architects and Mike Cart. Uh, Mike uh, will be speaking. Mike Critch will be speaking later this evening, and we've also been working with Hillcrest, the current owner of the site, who has been uh, working with the Pentagon Park site for uh, many years now. Um, we are really seeking to revitalize great urban locations like Pentagon Park, and we look forward to doing so on this site. Um, I'd like uh, Christina Smitten from Hillcrest to spend just a couple minutes uh, talking about the history of the project, and then she's going to turn it back to me to uh, talk about why we're doing this. Go ahead, Christina. Very good, Mr. Gunsbury. Yes. Ms. Smitten, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Hovland, members of the City Council. Director Teague, thanks for that quick intro. I'll also be quick, but we thought it would be beneficial if I did provide a little bit of context. Thank you, Mike, for pulling up the slides. Um, again, Christina Smitten with Hillcrest Development, and Hillcrest began acquiring the Pentagon Park properties around 2012-ish, 2012, 2012 to 2014. Um, and those properties include the 12 acres on the south side of West 77th, the purple area, that's Pentagon Village. Just across the street is uh, about a two acre parcel. And then Mike, if you wanna go to the next slide, please. The area of focus tonight is really in the orange, and that's referred to as 4640 and 4660 buildings. It's about a five acre parcel. Um, those buildings, those two buildings have not been improved. They haven't been renovated, but the other seven buildings um, just east of there in the red area, Mike, you can keep going. Those have had significant investment over the last couple of years for commercial use. Um, we've made exterior improvements to patio spaces and parking configurations. We've enhanced the entrances of those buildings and the, the entrance areas, created amenity spaces for our tenants, a training room, bike locker room. We have a sun deck. Oh, this one is actually tenant spaces that have modernized the interior of the mid-century buildings. Um, and here is the sun deck that I was gonna mention, and maybe some of you have been there. It's an indoor outdoor space in the 4550 building that is replicable in the other buildings. But just showing you these um, as we have made significant investment for the commercial use of those properties and we envision that in the long term. Um, we're excited about Solheim's proposal next to us, we do think residential is a good fit in the area. It'll be compatible with our commercial uses as well as the Fred and Pentagon Village and really the West 77th corridor. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it back over to Kurt, but Mayor Hovland and City Council members, I did just wanna provide a little bit of background there and let you know that of course I'll be available through the evening to answer any other questions that you may have. Very good, thanks Ms. Fenton. Thank, Thank you. Mr. All right, thank you, Mayor Hovland. Um, so 
uh, just in anticipation of what we're planning to present, this is truly a sketch plan and it's really in the rawest form. The reason we're presenting in a raw form is probably the most uh, complicated aspects of this site are how it connects to the park and how it connects to the existing uses along 77th Street. So while we're presenting a form that appears to be like a bunch of white boxes, which it really is when you'll see it, um, what we're really concerned about from uh, for you to comment on is how we connect to the park and how we interact with 77th Street and the neighbors. Um, as Christina said, housing is clearly a complementary use in this area. It's been anticipated for many years that housing would be added here. Um, we see many opportunities to connect uh, the green space of the park with our housing and thereby also provide connections to the other office uses and extended uses down 77th Street. We're confident that we can make meaningful connections for future residents at our development and for the people working at Pentagon Park. So for, for the Pentagon Park team, the use of, of this space long term is well understood. It's clearly office right now. Lots of office space, lots of parking, acres and acres of asphalt, um, as you're familiar with. Um, but we really look at at the site and we say, wow, what, what an amazing connection to this park that we have. And imagine if we can put all these apartments here and add four, five, 600 people adjacent to a park. That was what really attracted Solheim to the site so that we can do what we do really well, which is sustainable long-term development that really makes great spaces for people to live in. Um, the, the FAR, the floor area ratio, the setbacks, the height, the parking, at this point, we find that they're all very much conforming with the guidance from city staff and the city staff consultants. Uh, there's, there's probably some uh, discussion around the edges of what conforming might be, but very much we're on the same page. Um, we really see our plan as a modification of an old draft PUD uh, that really better aligns uh, with current and future comprehensive plans for the uh, plan goals for the area. Specifically, again, how do we connect to the park? Um, we're also working within the guidelines of the Greater Southdale District Plan, which is uh, intended to coordinate development throughout this area, I think both for transit and for park use, and of course for long-term development of the property tax base in the area. Um, we've, uh, we've read through Mick Johnson's letter, which was very clearly laid out and which we very much agree with. Um, I, I think the big question for the Council to consider is this tension that we have between parking and green space. How do we provide sufficient parking for 400 apartments and still provide these great connections to the park that all of us want? What we've come up with is a plan that uh, digs down as far as we can to just above the water table to provide underground parking and then builds up the grade a bit to include parking above grade within a berm or a hill uh, that will appear to be a natural space uh, to anybody passing by but will hide a lot of our parking. We've managed to fit over 500 parking stalls in the project, again, conforming with city guidelines. Um, as a company, we talk a lot about sustainability and we also do a lot about sustainability. We've independently built over six megawatts of solar panels uh, in the state of Minnesota, which provides electricity for about 3,000 homes. That's a lot of solar. We really believe in uh, in sustainability. We apply it also in best management practices for water use on the site and of course throughout the design of the interiors of our building. Um, there, there are some very specific bullet points I wanted to point out from the Planning Commission meeting before I hand off to Mike. Um, they, they gave us a very uh, very thoughtful feedback about uh, different aspects of the plan uh, and we were very much interested to hear the feedback. So here's a quick summary. Um, Along 77th Street, the facade of the building that we've shown is clearly pretty blank because it's a big white box, like I said. Um, what, what they'd like to see, and of course what Mick would like to see and we'd like to see too, is more articulated planes for the building, um, more uh, separate facades, uh, creating a rhythm along 77th Street. Um, They'd also say, like to see how we can better manage our entry points to the park. And specific feedback was, can we add a west side entry point to the park? Yes, we absolutely can. Can we enhance our east side entry point to the park? Absolutely. 
Um, as you'll see in the plans, we plan to add a bridge over the creek, uh, which will provide an immediate access point for this neighborhood to access the park. Um, but we also plan to add more inviting moments of benches, buffers with trees, water features, uh, pollinator gardens, things like that that make the environment much more friendly to people, to critters, to the future, to the climate. Um, the affordable housing question was another one that came up. Um, we are currently planning to follow Edina City guidelines lines for affordable housing. On top of that, you should know that our housing is of a smaller footprint type than what's typical for the city of Edina. This allows us to really deliver housing that's more in the 80, set, call it 70 to 90 percent of AMI. If you're not fully familiar with AMI, think of AMI as a bell curve. 100 percent of AMI is right smack in the middle. We're delivering housing that's really for the bottom of the middle class, top part of the lower class. That's kind of the sweet spot for what we develop and it'll be a natural part of our development. Call it naturally occurring affordable housing if you would. But we're very much adding to the housing stock of Edina in the areas where it's most needed. Um, we, we also heard from the Planning Commission that they'd like to see us develop basically a sustainability checklist, if you would, which I think is a great idea. And we, we integrate sustainability into all that we do. Uh, we've done gold lead certified buildings, including the first multifamily gold lead certified building in Minnesota. But we also, um, we also take it a step forward to figure out, well, how does lead apply to the Minnesota environment? What are things that we have to do to make it better fit behavioral uses of our tenants? Um, what we're planning to do with, uh, as we present further at our next round, not this round, but bring about a checklist that talks about best practices for stormwater management, which would, include, which would include things like swales, roof ponding, deeper setbacks at the creek to protect water quality uh, from runoff, energy conservation targets. Uh, we typically de deliver our energy package at about 40% below the current energy requirements, which is a really amazing accomplishment. Um, the Excel is always blown away by how well we do with that on our buildings, um, but we'll present that within a checklist to you guys. We plan to add roof gardens, and probably most importantly, we're planning to remove a lot of asphalt and impermeable surface on the site, which Mike will explain uh, further. This will allow uh, the soil to absorb rainwater that can actually eventually reach the aquifer. Um, it'll basically be returning a significant portion of the site to a more natural state. We also plan to uh, allow for ways to the to have our residents engage daily with the park. Um, how do we set up the best way for people to store their bikes? How do we maybe have a, a skating bank in our building, you know, skates available? Jason, you can talk more about that one later. Um, do we need to provide skis? Um, we've seen projects that provide paddling opportunities like kayaks. Is that something that can work here? Um, Perhaps more importantly, long term, we plan to do uh, significant stream bank restoration with our uh, building plans. We'll be adding native plants uh, in lieu of turf grass. Um, additionally, we'll be having uh, best practices for waste stream management within the building for both organics recycling and regular recycling. And something you should know about what we do in the interiors of our apartments is we don't use carpeting. Um, we actually prefer allergen free apartments, which allow lots of people who can't live in traditional apartment housing to live in the housing that we build. We include dual, dual flush toilets, low VOC paints, and again, we work a lot with the sun. Uh, we try to design our building in a way that can provide passive solar in the wintertime and, if possible, active solar in the summer. Just as an aside on solar, we don't think this building is a great candidate for solar. It steps down to the north significantly from six stories to five stories to four stories. And if you know anything about solar panels, they need sun in order to produce energy. And that's going to be very hard for us to achieve economically on this site. Um, with that, I'd like to hand the baton over to Mike Critch, our architect. Um, thank you for listening. All right. Can everybody hear me? Can. Go ahead. Okay. Finally. Uh, last time we had a little, a little bit of an issue. So good evening, Mayor Hovland, members of the council. Um, happy Groundhog's Day. Uh, 
I just want to let you know, my name is Mike Critch. I'm a partner with BKV Group. Uh, we've been around for over 40 years. I've been with that company for 32 years, uh, practicing in, in multifamily housing as well as government work. Um, and I'm very excited to be here tonight. Uh, and working with Kurt and his team, we're very excited to uh, try to continue to build on Edina's legacy of great projects. And um, I've personally had the privilege of, of working with the city of Edina on several other uh, projects within the city, uh, one Southdale place at Southdale Mall, as well as the Edina City Hall and Police Facility, among others. And so, again, thank you for uh, letting me present tonight here. Um, I want to just move, I'll move through this rather quickly. Um, there we go. Uh, I, our approach uh, before we start a project, and, and this is no different, is to really understand how our, what we're trying to do and what, what Kurt and his team are trying to do, how they marry up with uh, Edina and their comprehensive plan and the strategies for their various neighborhoods. And so um, we like to take a step back and understand elements of the, this comp plan. And uh, for this particular site, this, this site falls within the greater South, uh, Southdale district. And so uh, this is a long list of items that list some of the district goals. I'm not gonna go through each one of these items, but there are important topics that, that we wanna make sure we're integrating into, the, into our project as we move along and progress the design, such as creating unique experiences, uh, creating pattern and connectivity, understanding the proper scale and form, uh, creating great placemaking, and really valuing and, and um, instilling sustainability and resilience within our designs. And those marry up uh, completely with Solheim's uh, goals for what they do with every project. Um, additionally, the site goals at, at our location as well uh, to create connected and integrated and pedestrian friendly spaces uh, is at the heart of what we're trying to do at this site. Um, this table represents some of the uh, uh, zoning information. I'm not going to go over that in detail. Uh, as Kurt mentioned, we're trying to really fit and be in sync with with the guidelines. Um, our our setbacks are actually greater than than what the um, minimums are, and this will provide us the flexibility that we want to have to be able to create these great uh, pedestrian places and spaces that provide connectivity. Uh, along West 77th to the park and being able to uh, um, entertain that through public places as well. Um, the, at the bottom of this chart here is, is one of the features that Kurt described and the current diagram on the left represents the existing conditions which is at about a 24% permeability. So the site really is made up of uh, a large surface park, asphalt parking lot, as well as the building itself. And so there's not a lot left related to green space and how does that relate to uh, what we're trying to do to uh, better our environment. And, and our proposal tries to significantly improve upon that. And so the current design is roughly at about a 45% permeability. So um, we're going to try, try to continue to improve upon that. We're trying to fit all our parking as much as we can underneath the footprint of the building itself to leave as much green space, open space, permeable space as possible. Uh, again, our site is located along West 77th between Highway 100 and France Avenue. Uh, and um, what we wanted to show, and we didn't actually show this uh, well enough at the uh, Planning Commission last week, but we thought it was important just to illustrate what the current conditions are. And uh, the image on the left shows our site in the middle of all of this. It's about a 500 foot by 500 foot parcel between uh, office complex to the west, uh, surrounded by uh, parking, as well as office complex on the right as well. And 
And so I think that's important. The depth from West 77th to the park is again, 500 feet. The image on the above, the above right image shows the view looking east down West 77th. And so that's one of the focus areas of, of our design is to enhance that pedestrian quality and character. The image in the middle is a, a shot between the existing building and the building, the office building that will be staying to the left and showcases that distance to the park. And so th there were discussions uh, last week with planning commission that we wanted to really understand and listen to. And there was this discussion about be seeing the park and making sure it's visible. And I think part of what we wanna just make sure we understand, and again, it's 500 feet, you can see trees in the, in the distance, but you're not necessarily seeing the park itself. And I, I think what we took away from that is, what's really important is the experience and the journey of getting from West 77th to the park itself. And once you arrive at the park, you're you're there, but it's that journey and creating the best experience possible um, to get to that. Uh, and, and that's what we'll focus on as we evolve the design. And then the bottom image again is, is as we move further east and, and again, that distance. This also shows more importantly, the, the grade elevation differences um, and there's, at a minimum, a 10 foot grade dif difference from the street edge up to the middle of the site. And so that topography is a, an important element of what we're trying to deal with with our design. Uh, as discussed, this shows the diagram of our proposed site uh, with our site in the middle here. And there are three really, I think, overriding principles that we wanna really establish and, and create. Um, and one in creating a U-shaped building, there, there are three major elements. One is really activating the streetscape along West 77th um, and activating that and, and improving upon what, um, what will, we think can be a great street experience. Uh, the connection itself from West 77th to the park and having that be a green experience for all the things uh, Kurt talked about, um, and then embracing the park in, itself and with the orientation and configuration of our building, we're really wanting to allow and bring in the park itself within and into our development. Um, this diagram here shows uh, just some of the features that we think are important to, to our plan, uh, the main orientation is a U-shaped configuration that opens up to the park itself. So we have the narrowest part of our building fronting the park itself and letting the majority of the open space embrace the park and, and again, blur the lines between where park ends and where our courtyard begins. Having the narrow faces of our building there, we think has the least impact to the uh, users of the park and the residents across, across the way. Um, and so we think that's important in terms of this. And then our, our, our building steps from four stories up to five stories to six stories along West 77th. And it also kind of cascades back and widens the space along the east and west sides as well. And so those are important features as we look to really improve the pedestrian connections along the east side, as well as on the west side. Um, and then some of the images around here show some of the features that we really want to uh, study and engage and incorporate, uh, whether it's uh, uh, plazas, uh, uh, fitness areas, um, public bridges that will connect across the, the creek to, to the uh, park pathways and bike paths, having features for, for pets, again, uh, enhanced pets pedestrian ways. Again, that experience of getting to the park we see is really important. The, the, the front door of our project is 50, 55 feet in width. We have a lot of room to really create more of this urban setting. So there's this contrast of more of the urban setting along West 77th and then the park-like setting uh, on the north side. And we want to embrace both. We think they're very different and our design will evolve to reflect that. Um, 
as we move to some of the axonometrics, I think these are um, good to show just the scale and form of our building. Uh, this image in the upper left, for example, shows the six stories fronting along West 77th. We have 55 feet here in width. The majority of our parking is buried. We have a we have a small portion up front that is not at the moment, but we're we're going to study how we use the earth topography to either bury or hide or or create ingenious ways to make this uh, a, an inviting place. The the place out in front here is you know well over twenty or twenty five feet wide, and we think that can be. A, a nice pedestrian experience. The grade itself traverses up again to bury most of the parking. So you're arriving at this port cochere in the middle. Um, and that allows for, for access and separation from West 77th to our arrival court. The building itself along West 77th, as, as Kurt mentioned, um, this is just a massing model. It doesn't show a lot of the things that we'll use uh, to make this really inviting, exciting, unique, friendly, such as alternating the forms, um, adding balconies and key locations, um, creating a play on the materials that we use, creating undulations within the facade, and understanding windows and fenestration, and all of those will be part of our exploration. The building itself in three dimensions also undulates, uh, undulates as it travels towards the park. Again, this, this shows the idea of uh, creating a strong pedestrian connection. We have a ways to go to develop that, but that's important. The image on the upper right shows the west side, again, with the feedback from the Planning Commission. We're going to rethink this whole thing to, so that that also is a pedestrian connection that's workable. And then the bottom two axonometric uh, images just show the, the courtyard opening to the park and vice versa, inviting that into the space. Um, this this next image just is a cut through the middle of the building, showcasing uh, again the parking in red that where most of it is buried, and um, then we do have amenity spaces at that top level in red that connect from the front side through to our courtyard side, and then housing above. Again, this section down below here in the middle. Our, our highest portion of the building is closest to West 77th, and then the building cascades and steps down to five stories and then four stories at the end to mitigate the, the height as it approaches the park. And then the bottom image shows the true scale from our building across the park to, to residences. And with that, I, I think I will um, hang it up here and turn it back to Kurt um, and the rest of the group. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike. Back to it, Mr. Gunsbury. Thank you, Mike. So I think what we have now, Mayor Hovland and council members, is just questions for you. Um, what do you want to see here? Uh, what, what ideas do you have or concerns do you have about our connectivity to the park? Um, what concerns do you have about 77th Street in particular, perhaps? Um, one of my one of my questions is if I'm going to live in this building, how are you going to make this park a more inviting place? Because it's an amazing space, but it's not very well developed. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to um, to the Edina team for questions. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mr. Gunsbury. Uh, Member Pierce, would you care to go first? Would you care to lead us off? Uh, sure. Thank you, uh, Mayor Hublin. Um, so there are a couple of things on here. I, you know, I'd start with, um, I think that your plan, um, you've clearly been thinking through how to use the green spaces. Um, I like the idea that you're thinking about how to integrate uh, the usage of the park. Uh, those are things that uh, many of our residents um, um, I get are excited about uh, lots of green spaces, inviting for pedestrians uh, and what have you. Um, I also like the step down effect that you have as you're if you're on 77th as you approach the park, 
Um, I do think that that is um, a very creative way to uh, minimize this this uh, feeling if you're in the park that there's this huge tower um, that's approaching you. And so I do like that idea. Um, I, I wasn't impressed with some of your uh, sustainability. Um, that definitely is a big plus. Um, um, you mentioned that this isn't the best site for use of solar, uh, but you did talk about ways to enhance sust sustainability inside the building, your usage of water. Uh, you'd still be able to use natural light um, to enhance sus sustainability, some of the materials that you might use. I think all of those are very good um, enhancements um, as well. Um, there are... Um, I, I'd also credit the fact that you, when you look at the guidelines and the setbacks, um, that for the most part, you're meeting um, all of those. Um, and to be honest, that's not necessarily always the case uh, with um, developers, but in some cases you're exceed, you may be even exceeding those. Uh, the only question that, that I had, um, and it's, it's, I'll express it as a concern, um, but I'm not an expert, uh, so I will express this as a concern. Uh, when you talked about parking, uh, for other plans that we've looked at, that has been a challenge. And to hear you say you do have below grade parking and you're gonna dig down to just above the water table <laughs> so that you can put uh, um, some of the parking um, underground, below grade. Um, I think that that is, is noble uh, for sure. Uh, but as we know, over time, our water table is continuing to rise. And so that gives me a little bit of pause for uh, concern, probably not in the near term. Um, but that would be the one thing that I would for sure um, want to make sure that um, our staff has uh, takes a look at um, ensuring that with that concept um, that we don't um, end up with a lot of uh, water issues um, in the way that we would manage that. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think that that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Member Pierce, and I'll go next to Member Anderson. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Gunsbury, uh, I just want to commend you. You've done a very nice job and hit a lot of the high notes here. Um, your 80% AMI uh, business model, I think, is um, extremely attractive. You, uh, I'm not quite sure how you're going to accomplish that, but uh, um, I'm, I'm pulling for you. Uh, <laughs> it's a legitimate affordable housing classification, and um, it will tie into the affordable housing goals of the city. So um, good thinking on that. Um, I, I, I'm hearing you address many of the concerns that the Planning Commission brought forward to you. Um, they're not, I, I, have you done any design progress or made any design progress from that or you're in the process of evaluating and implementing? Uh, we're definitely in the process of evaluating and we were waiting until we got council feedback because we only met with the planning commission last sure. week so it allows us to kind of incorporate all those voices together for our next round of design changes great great thank you um so the you're you're giving attention to the west side approach to the park i'm hearing that i think that's important um i, I don't know what's coming down the the line um and so, you know, the main access there, uh, it may be, in, at least in the short term, that this project is going to provide access to the park from 77th. Uh, you know, we don't, we haven't achieved anything more yet. And I think uh, it, it, that the rest of that is a ways out, feels like it. Um, you're, the the, the U-shaped design that faces the park is, is really quite exemplary. So I congratulate you on that as well. Um, on the east side, uh, stopping points along the way there could be useful. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily address it as the potential for gathering points, but stop points. Um, people will be coming along. There's going to be people coming in and out of the park. 
Um, I'm not. I'm. I'm hearing you talk about the bridge and access to the bike path. So what, of course, that'll entail is people are being coming over that bridge and approaching, and you'd like to direct them around in some way. So I think that you know you want to give that some consideration um, along, especially I think on the uh, on the east side that seems most logical. Um, the 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 four hundred foot street wall. Um, is a challenge for you, I know. And uh, the elevation uh, at 77th um, will continue to present uh, design concerns. Um, how you do that will be of great interest. I, I, I heard a discussion of uh, glass, uh, a lot of glass, see-through, of course, you know, that's typical in there. Um, how you how you break that space up from that great 400 foot expanse is is going to really be a uh, it's going to be a challenge for you. Um, you've done a great job in the rear, and so now um, the statement on 77th uh, is is uh, I, you know so so I in, in, in when as I think of it I think as a matter of fact Commissioner Miranda um, discussed uh, the sidewalk and your drop point. And the traffic that that generates, the kind of congestion points in there are pieces. Um, you'll solve that in some way as to how you uh, bring the sidewalk in. But, you know, with the number of units that you're suggesting and the traffic that could be coming in and out of there, um, that is, as, as pedestrians move across there, or bikers try to get to the, to the path uh, on the... Uh, on the south side, uh, then that's it, that's going to be a continuing concern in here. And I know you're thinking about it, so I, I don't want to belabor that. Uh, I, I thought that Commissioner Agnew's use of the term iconic or the potential for iconic uh, at your at your entry was um, that was a good suggestion um, because I think you've got. You've got the potential for a great building and a great project, and that that piece right there is going to define it, though, for everybody driving by, everybody coming off 100 uh, as as Pentagon South fleshes out in the future, the traffic that's generated there, that your building is going to be the one that's going to be most notable and most visible right there in that site. The exterior of the existing buildings uh, there, you know, they're, they're, people are used to seeing those, and there's, you know, they've been there for a long time. It has a very, um, uh, people are used to that. Your building is going to strike the note uh, there, so I'm, I'm trusting that you're, that you'll come up with something there. Um, I think it, it, that that's really what I have. I, I know that you're planning. I know that you intend to to meet the affordable housing uh, policy. Uh, guidelines for the city, and you're, you've got to start at uh, 80 percent AMI. Of course, you know what the the uh, heard you go through the options that you have the other night. Um, so uh, I'm sure that you'll find a way to approach that that meets your business model. And um, also, just want to uh, note your uh, decrease your increased permeability on site. It's striking. You've you've doubled it. Uh, and uh, so I think that's appreciated as well. So thank you for all your work so far. Thank you, Councilmember Anderson. Thank you, Member Anderson. And next, Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I want to commend you guys for working well with our comprehensive plan. I really appreciate you using that as your reference from the beginning. Um, that means a lot. Um, I have one comment about affordable housing. This is such a fantastic site for families. I hope you will consider having some three and four bedroom units um, for families with multiple kids. Uh, I think it would just be a lovely place to raise kids. You've got that park and all this green space. And so that's one thing that we don't see uh, um, nearly enough of are some of those larger units for, for families. Um, I'd like to see, Mr. Crutch, on your slide number five, I have uh, some questions about how um, walking around um, this uh, building would look like. If I don't know if you can pull that up, but I noticed there's an indentation 
um, between the, the six stories and the five stories. Is that something that you can walk from the west side to the east side? So if I were to work in Miss Smitten's building, um, yeah, there it is, um, in this uh, northwest building, can I walk through there and then go across to the building to the east, or would I have to go all the way down to the street and across? Is that a, a walkway, or what is that? Well, thank you, uh, Council Member Jackson. Uh, what we are exploring here is, because this is a large building, we are looking at ways to break down the scale of it, and we are, in fact, at these junctures, pulling the building apart, to create um, connections just at the corridor. And so these would become glassy links. Uh, mm -hmm. And so at the ground level, I, we need to explore that more to see if we connect through or if we allow a, a break um, and you go out the door at the ground level uh, across that way and then into a door to the next to keep that open for pedestrians to travel in the east-west direction. Um, I, I'm taking note of your comments here, and I think we need to explore that and see if that's a possibility. Yeah, because I'm just thinking if I lived in that northwest building, um, I'd love to be able to walk to work, right? And mm -hmm. if I had a job either across the street or, or to the east, um, it would be after a long day, you know, to walk through and not have to go all the way around the building would be really nice. Um, the other walkability question I have is from the front version, front of the building. And again, if I'm coming in, if I'm walking to work, what is that experience going to be like? Is the sidewalk along that curved driveway uh, going to be safe and, and accessible? And if I am coming from across the street at the hotel, for instance, or if I'm coming from an office building to the east, how easy is it going to be for me to come across 77th Street um, and, and into the building? Um, so thinking of that, yeah. So we've got the driveway there and how that um, interacts with being able to walk on the sidewalk. Um, I'd like to see that just as comfortable and inviting as driving up. Um, so if I had an elderly relative who lived there, we could drive up and drop them off. Or if I was walking to work, I would feel comfortable just in the same way. Um, so those are my um, my two comments. I you know with the I looked through the guidelines and and this does is written out in the comprehensive plan as a 200 by 200 um, square blocks. Uh, like in the other parts of the Southdale district, it feels different here. Um, I'm, I'm not as in, insistent on having that, um, but it does give a sense. It is a good guideline for sort of what it feels like to walk and and feel that it, things are to human scale when you're trying to navigate through um, a, a plot of land. And so I, I like those cutouts um, that break the buildings apart. It helps with that feeling of not being so overwhelming, a big wall of of building, but I would like, um, I know, and there are security issues for apartment buildings, but I would like to think if I lived in one of these apartments, it would be easy for me to walk around there. Um, you did ask for our, our guidance on, um, on the connection to the park. I love this path on the east side. I think it would be great to walk. It'd be a very happy place to live. It'd be a happy place to visit. Um, and I, I like that. I, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness you've put into that. And um, also into all the sustainability. I'm excited to see your checklist. Um, that's going to be really cool. So um, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Member Jackson. And then on to Member Staunton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, I echo a lot of the comments that my colleagues have made and that the Planning Commission made as well. Um, a lot of good comments. Um, if you could put up slide number four, from the packet, which is the one of the broader area, maybe back in. That one right there. So um, to amplify on some of the comments some of my colleagues have made, you know, one of the things that this slide really highlights is what an opportunity you have along 77th Street because you're going to be first <laughs> and you get to set the tone. You get to you get to really 
whatever happens here will will set the table for what happens all the way up and down 77th Street over time. And so, you know, I, I agree with all the comments about the challenges with the elevations and the and the long wall, et cetera. But but I just highlight for you what a what a great opportunity it is to create that kind of signature um, place that can also as uh, Councilmember Anderson said, you know, it's really going to provide access. We we don't have access to the park right now from 77th, and this will mm -hmm. provide at least pedestrian access to the park. And to answer your question, we're working on it. We've got a plan for the park, but we don't have any money for the park. We're working on that. We just had a meeting last week about efforts to make that happen. So we are working on it, and it is a real priority for us. But and having more people here would help that as well. Um, so I like the residential use. I like the configuration, the way you're embracing the park that, you know, when we looked at this before, there was a lot of cars between the building and the park, which didn't make much sense to me. So I love the, the transition from the building to the park. Um, and then the more you can do to make that a great place on the east side as well as maybe on the west side to get back and forth for pedestrians from the park to the to west 77 and then think about you know how it's going to interact how are people from south side of 77th going to get to your place and get to the park and how what's that interaction like how is this part of the reason i wanted to put up this slide is it it shows you that it's a it's a centerpiece of a much broader area and can really leverage a lot of that those other opportunities um and then you know to the to the 200 by 200 um block notion that councilmember jackson raised um it is a, a I think that's part of that challenge with that 400 foot front. Is there some way to make that feel like it's not as massive? Um, and so that's really a design issue that I think you got to wrestle with. And I can't add much more than everyone else has on that. Thing. But otherwise, and I, I like, you know, the affordability. Councilmember Anderson mentioned that 80% AMI, you know. One of the things that I've been talking a lot about on housing in our community is is affordability is an entire continuum, and we should have options for folks at places all along the continuum. So I, I welcome having something in that 80% range is really, I think, would really help fill a need. So I think you've got a great start, and I look forward to seeing um, seeing how it evolves. Thank you. All right, thank you, Member Sutton. Um, I hope these aren't uh, uh, these comments aren't too redundant, but I think you're off to a, a great start as well as Member Sutton points out. Uh, there's some very thoughtful things that have been done here, um, in no particular order. With that same slide still up, uh, I would say that um, voting that height towards 77th is uh, a good thing. Uh, almost doubling the permeability is really an extraordinary accomplishment, and this is just sketch plan phase. Uh, as you work on this notion of how to create really what you, what I think Mick Johnson characterized it as the ecological framework for how how uh, um, the built environment interacts with uh, nature is really going to be a, a significant thing here. And as Member Staunton points out, you're going to be setting the tone for what else happens along 77th adjacent to the park. And so we're really keen about this, uh, working on this together with you. Uh, the notion that you ought to be able to access the park on the east and west sides of your buildings, I think is really critical. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of uh, if you're down in um, uh, South Beach, where uh, my brother brothers-in-law have a place. Uh, as you as you go across Collins Avenue, you think about that as 77th. There's all kinds of places between buildings that there are easements on private property for the public to be able to access the beach beyond and, and the boardwalk beyond. And I think uh, you got to think about that the, the same way. And then on 77th itself, uh, the way the 
the sidewalk is sketched in. It's uh, uh, behind the bulkhead. And I think we got to think that through a little bit, too. Uh, either if it's going to stay behind the bulkhead, it's got to be wider uh, than a conventional sidewalk, I believe. Uh, but, of course, uh, being able to accomplish some of the things that uh, we talk about in the uh, design principles of having a, a double layer of trees, maybe you can do it the way you've got it set up here in the, in the schematic, uh, but give it some thought as to whether you can pull that off with uh, pulling the sidewalk back a little bit more, too. It's complicated because you've got that, uh, that elevated drive in, and um, remember Jackson mentioned that uh, you need to be careful how you interact with... Uh, with pedestrians, but pedestrians have to be mindful too of uh, uh, of, of where they are, and uh, cars need to be careful coming in and out of that uh, elevated driveway. I actually think it's quite a uh, unique feature, and could be extraordinary because you're actually moving uh, traffic up away from pedestrians as you climb that elevation to the to the front door in the port cashier. So I think that has some really interesting possibilities. At first, I was a little bit. Uh, off put by the fact that you've got such a challenge with that long front, but the fact that you've created the, uh, uh, you know, I'll call it those butt ends of the building sticking out there, you've created kind of a minor uh, C uh, breaking up uh, the that building front with that articulation uh, is really helpful. And you may be able to create some really interesting aspects there. And I think actually the change in elevation from the street to the port cashier will help you with that. And it might not make the the length that you have to run uh, so uh, you know so off-putting. Um, it's a 500 by fun and 500 foot square site. Uh, I I don't embrace the idea at all of the trying to live with a 200 by 200 foot block here. Uh, to me, it's a different setting than actually over in the in the Pierre Saltdale district between France and York. Uh, I, I view this in a totally different way. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the continuity between parkland and the new developments will really uh, be important, not only how you enhance social connections, but also just the way um, the creek uh, interacts with private property. So you have that seamless sort of connection that we've talked about from time to time in the past is, is really something I think that's important, too. Um, the, uh, uh, let's see. The parking strategy, I think you've got an outstanding parking strategy. The being able to park it the way you're suggesting it be parked uh, and being mindful of uh, Member Pierce's uh, cautions about uh, uh, dealing with uh, water. I think we've had this conversation before uh, and that there are some modern technologies that allow you to, to, to face that issue and still park it the way you're intending to park it, which is, uh, I think, really uh, an appealing part of this whole development. Um, so I want to reinforce that idea. The U-shaped footprint is a great model for consideration, I think, for uh, not only this development, but future developments along uh, 77th. The way you've uh, accomplished that articulation on the east and west sides of the buildings, I think, is really important to break up that, uh, that single plane. Uh, and I think you've done an effective job of that. Um, so the... Uh, Integration of open space. This is back to where Mr. Gunsbury was in the first place, I think. Um, how do we want the building to connect to the park? How do we want the building to connect to the street? I think you're off to a very good start. Uh, how are we going to address uh, ecological... Uh, um, uh, they're not really collisions, but they're I I interfaces, I think, uh, mm -hmm. that we need to be thinking about, too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then... Um, the parking we talked about, I, I just think, too, I think you're off to a really uh, uh, quite a thoughtful start, as I mentioned at the beginning of my comments, and I'm eager to see where you go from here with respect to uh, further building design uh, and the interaction with the park and the street. So thank you very much for, uh, you know, really being sensitive to what I think you've learned over time about what uh, we want to accomplish together with any uh, development partners that we have in the city. We're in this together. We're trying to do things for the Edina that are going to be here for 100 years, and we want to do things that we're both proud of. And you're off to a good start on creating that level of pride uh, and distinction, I think, with respect to this particular property, Mr. Gunsbury. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Holden. Thank you. So those are my comments, and I, I hope they were uh, collectively of, of value to you. Um, 
and we'll look forward to um, seeing you back here with us again. All right, thank you, Edina team. All right, thank you. And then we're gonna move on to um, the next sketch plan uh, that Kerry Teague has as well, and that is 4040 West 70th Street, which is planned as a uh, senior affordable development, uh, kind of right behind the vitamin store on in the Kinderbury Hill on uh, on 70th, right by the roundabout, uh, 70th and Valley View. So, Director Teague. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor, members of the count of the uh, City Council. As mentioned, this property is just west of 70th Street. The proposal here is to tear down the existing office building and build a three to four story senior affordable uh, project, 118 units. It would be 75 units an acre consistent with the, comp with the comprehensive plan with underground parking. This is a site that uh, that is held by the Edina Housing Foundation. Similar to our Amundsen project, they uh, uh, solicited um, developer help and Lupe Development, Development Partners, Steve Min was selected by the Housing Foundation. And Steve is here this evening to present the project. So with that, I will turn it over uh, to Steve to introduce his development team and present the project. All right, very good, Director Teague. Thank you, and Mr. Min, welcome. Nice to see you again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Teague, and members of the council. Appreciate the invitation this evening, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to introduce our project to you. Um, I am Steve Min with Loopy Development, but we have a fairly large team from Ecumen as well. They are our partners in this project, and so let me just take a couple of moments to introduce the project concept to you. We're a, we're a 118 unit, 100% affordable uh, senior project. Uh, as uh, Mr. Teague indicated, the, ho the Housing Foundation selected our team, both us, Ecumen and Loopy Development, as part of an RFQ process. Uh, I think part of the reason that the team was selected is we were willing to adopt permanent affordability, which is a very unique concept. Most of you who are familiar with affordability know that uh, there's usually a term limit, 20, 30 years. We're looking at a 99 year permanent affordability project here. So briefly, let me tell you a little bit about our team. Uh, Acumen Development is one of the 25 largest nonprofit affordable housing developers in the country. Loopy Development is one of the 25 smallest developers in Edina. We're only five people, uh, but my bride and I have uh, raised our children here in Edina for the last 22 years. We're actually in Mr. Overholt's grandparents' house in uh, Indian Hills. Uh, we have partnered four times. This will be our fourth collaboration with Ecumen. We've done projects in uh, Minneapolis and we're doing other projects in Minneapolis. And our team tonight uh, includes uh, Ann Stanfield, my colleague, who's the head of business development for Ecumen, uh, who will give you an overview of the project. Zach Rosnow from Pope Architects, uh, and Brian Werdeman from Kimley Horn, our civil engineers, and also helping us with some of the stormwater design. So I really don't want to take too much time uh, burdening you with uh, other than the introductions. I want Mr. Rosnow to get into the outline of the project, and then we would be happy to entertain Q&A from both the staff and from the council as to how we're proceeding on this proposed project. So Zach, why don't you take it away? All right. Thank you, Mr. Men. Mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, introductions are easier off mute. Uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of the City Council, uh, I'm Zach Rosno. Uh, I'm a senior project designer with uh, Pope Architects, as uh, Steve mentioned. Um, I'm excited to show uh, your our project concept here and, and kind of take you through our, um, our idea that, that we prepared for sketch plan. Um, we can start here uh, as the slide advances, uh, sort of with the general uh, context uh, of the neighborhood. Uh, this is at the corner of uh, West 70th and Bellevue Road. Um, I'm sure you all are very familiar with the site. Um, we've got the Cornelia neighborhood off to the west. Uh, and um, of course, this is just to the uh, west of 
here we go, of, of France, France Avenue. Kinderberry uh, is adjacent to our east, and then Salon Concepts up to the to the north. Um, as we get back to the site plan here, we take a little bit closer look at um, the site. Uh, we looked at a number of um, site factors. We wanted to make sure addressed uh, a number of the parameters, uh, including solar, uh, vehicular, pedestrian orientation, um, and general overall massing uh, was, was very important to us. Um, we're in, uh, in looking at the Greater South Dale uh, District design guidelines. Um, we're in transition zone one, uh, which means that you know we'll be transitioning from the single family residential uh, of Cornelia neighborhood uh, into the more commercial district and ultimately over to um, the higher density of, at France Avenue. So we wanted to make a, a, a project and create a, a building and environment that was uh, contemporary and, and still uniquely Edina. Uh, there's a number of um, site features here that I'll let uh, Brian from Kimley Horn get into a little bit later with the rain gardens uh, and the and the parking circulation, but essentially we wanted to, to drive off of 70th. Uh, there was less traffic uh, on that side of the roundabout, or I'm sorry, off of, off of Valley View, uh, more, less traffic there, more traffic off of was 70th. Um, our program here generally is, uh, is a 80, 20 mix of one bedrooms, 80% one bedrooms, 20%, uh, two bedroom units, um, as Steve said, we're 118 units, uh, about 120 parking spaces, 25 of them will be uh, on the site. Uh, and we've mixed uh, the units uh, in, in throughout to, to help with views and, um, and create a little, a nice little mix. Uh, our elevations are you know, it's sketch plan, so we're generally uh, fairly schematic, but we wanted to create a building that uh, really embraced um, daylighting, also had a number of um, uh, nice uh, features such as uh, the stone elements that we held towards the roundabout, towards the south and to the um, west. Uh, we had our, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but um, in this west elevation, uh, we stepped down from three stories down to two stories uh, toward our interior courtyard. Um, that's to help allow daylight uh, to come through and naturally daylight as many spaces as, as possible. Uh, our east elevation is, um, of course, faces France. And, and the idea here is, um, since this is our, our tallest facade, um, the top part of this um, this darker metal, the, the dark portion is the metal, uh, would be sort of a feature element. It would be some um, feature metal that, that would sort of announce itself from France Avenue and, and from a distance um, and could, could bring people to um, this area and, and create a sense of placemaking. Uh, along with that idea, um, we want to, to embrace the idea of um, art. So this metal facade could be um, could be interpreted as, as a piece of art. We're going to have an art gallery or an art space um, down here in the two-story uh, portion of the building. And then out in the corner towards um, the roundabout, we'll have some sort of sculpt sculptural or um, art display out there uh, as well. Uh, as Steve said, the project is going to be 100% a, a affordable, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, following up here, but uh, we just wanted to incorporate a, a variety of income levels and, and household types um, within this within this project for the Edina community. Uh, this rendering and the next rendering, I know there was a little bit of a concern about um, the sidewalks being right on Valley View, Valley View, um, we'll go back when Brian, uh, when I pass it over to Brian here, we're actually back off of uh, the street about four feet and we have a, 
a site section that that will show that. But the important thing to focus on with some of these renderings is um, how the rain gardens are front and center. And for us, that provides an opportunity for uh, education for the public. You know, as as we get our, our rain events, um, this will they will fill and dry out, uh, and that change and having them sort of front and center is, is a nice way to, um, we think, educate about how we're, how we're dealing with rainwater. So um, I think I'll go back to the site plan here. And uh, Brian, maybe you can talk a little bit more about um, circulation and, and rainwater. Sure. Thanks, Zach. Um, Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Brian Werdeman. I'm with Kimley Hornet Associates, and we'll be the civil engineers uh, and landscape architects for the project. Um, as you can see here on the screen that Zach is sharing, um, from a site circulation perspective, uh, the southern two axes, uh, we're proposing a one-way circulation um, for a surface parking lot, which is primarily going to be used for uh, guests and visitors of the facility, um, there will be a porta a share uh, on the the building side there along the west elevation. Um, then the the northern driveway access is going to be a ramp down to the lower level uh, parking area, uh, which will be obviously primarily for um, those folks that live in the building um, and um, so the accesses, as Zach had mentioned, are, are proposed off of Valley View, um, just due to more limited traffic numbers allow for easier accessibility in and out of the site. Um, from a stormwater perspective, uh, in our meetings with the neighborhood, this is obviously a, a very important um, thing in the area. There are some uh, existing flood concerns to the northwest that we were made aware of by city engineering as well as some current concerns that were raised by residents. Um, this proposed project uh, will incorporate the rain, rain gardens that Jack had uh, mentioned along Valley View Road. Uh, those will be linked in series with a underground stormwater management system uh, which will provide enhanced uh, quality rate and volume controls uh, for the stormwater from the site, which would be a drastic improvement over what's out there today. Um, additionally, uh, with the stormwater BMPs located on the west side of the or west side of the site, um, that will allow for uh, the potential of any existing drainage tailwater concerns um, to to fill the system um, potentially and ease the burden on the neighborhood um, from what it's experiencing today. So. We anticipate a, a significant significant improvement uh, from stormwater quality uh, on the site. Uh, and then as Zach had mentioned, um, sidewalks uh, also came up during our neighborhood meeting. This overall plan, you can see uh, there is a boulevard along Valley View Road and 70th Street between the street and the sidewalk. Uh, and then there's also been um, some conversations as to the width of that sidewalk um, and potentially increasing to allow for um, better pedestrian circulation um, in and around the site. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Zach. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Werderman. Um, I think maybe now, Anne, if you want to talk a little bit about the uh, the function and the program of the building. Great, thanks Zach and um, good evening mayor and council members. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this project with you. Um, I am senior director of business development at Ecumen. As Steve mentioned, we are development partners on this project. Ecumen will also be the manager of the building when it opens. Um, Ecumen is um, not only a developer, but we own and manage over 40 or over 40 um, senior housing communities in four states ranging in scope from um, independent living 
to skilled nursing, memory care, assisted living. So um, we are excited to to um, serve seniors in Edina. We don't have a presence in Edina currently and being um, a Metro-based um, home office, uh, we are excited to expand our reach of serving seniors in our community. Um, so um, I think as Zach mentioned, the project is 100% affordable. It is 118 units of one bedroom and two bedroom apartments. Um, and they are affordable ranging from 30% to 80% AMI, um, which is great, um, you know, that we can serve uh, a variety of folks, um, especially in Edina, um, where there's very limited options for affordable senior housing currently, um, specifically age restricted. Um, this would be available to seniors 55 plus. Um, and um, another thing that we are excited about in Acumen's approach to projects is really making them project specific and location specific. Um, for not just for seniors, but for anyone, this location could not be more exciting for housing, given the proximity to amenities, um, the walkability, um, amenity rich as it relates to services as well as um, entertainment. So um, for the target population, um, this will be a great walkable site um, to access those amenities. In terms of creating uh, location-specific programming, Zach mentioned some of the arts programming, which um, we know is an important um, component of, of um, programming in Edina and interest to the community. Um, in addition to that, we have reached out and are partnering with a handful of organizations to develop, um, again, site-specific programming um, based on the needs of the population uh, at um, uh, within Edina. So we have, we will be partnering with the Edina Chamber of Commerce. We're working on what that partnership looks like, um, as well as Minnesota State University Mankato, their Edina campus. Um, Acumen has a partnership with them already at um, our Mankato campus. Um, so we're excited to bring programming and educational programming, volunteerism, um, and such to, to this community as well, to really make this a special and enriching community for seniors of Edina. Um, in terms of design and um, planning for, for this specific population, I, I think, you know, we have, a, we're proposing a very nice balance of, um, of design uh, elements that are specific for um, a 55 plus population to ensure their safety. Um, handrails in the hallways, lighting, extensive lighting, um, building amenities that meet their needs, um, a drop off area. Uh, uh, however, we are also providing um, amenities that are that are very um, compelling in terms of lifestyle. So balconies on many of the units in unit washer dryer. So, you know, I think um, bringing a, a long term affordable building to Edina um, that is um, programmed with the residents in mind that is locally specific. Um, you know, we're really excited about that opportunity. We think it's it will add a lot to the community and um, we look forward to hearing your feedback and answering any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Stanfield. Uh, I'll take it back to uh, Mr. Min or however, do you want uh, any more input from any of the members of your team, Mr. Min? Are you ready to stand for questions? Uh, Mr. Mayor, if, uh, before we do that, I just want to make, if I may, two or three more points just so that the council and you have um, a perspective about some of the energy efficient elements in the design. We are proposing a PV solar, 40, 40 kW solar system on the building. 
we have, uh, as Mr. Werdeman pointed out, a rather complex stormwater management system under the surface parking lot. We believe in providing the same quality amenities in our affordable projects as we do in our market rate projects. And so for that reason, this building with this design, not only do we have the materials that you're looking at in an appropriate mix, but our interior uses, a community room, a fitness center, uh, as Ann has mentioned, uh, some art uh, uh, making spaces. Uh, we are also hoping to have a guest suite available for people who need to have a family member stay over. These are things that we would put in our market rate buildings and we would do no less in our affordable. Uh, the last item I want to add before we take uh, any of your questions would be that our, our main objective is to have a step down to the west while still having sufficient economies of scale to qualify the project for the, the limited amount of dollar resources that are available to do affordable housing and still provide a nice looking package on the outside. So we took some feedback from the neighbors who wanted us to have as little as two stories on the west. We feel this is the right mix where we step to two in a, in a couple of spaces, but for the most part, we're three story to the west and four stories or more to the, uh, to the east. We think this design of this building accesses the streets correctly and provides them the highest modicum of access and safety for both pedestrian and for the type of audience that we're serving. And we did take some feedback in particular from uh, the community about orienting the building and we would be happy to have your feedback about how we've oriented that. So Mr. Mayor, with those, those comments, we'll stand for questions and feedback with your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Min. Uh, and we will start those council feedback uh, comments now. I'm gonna ask, uh, I'm gonna go in reverse, uh, ask member Staunton to go first this time. Member Staunton? I figured there'd be a payback Uh, I'm trying to adopt the uh, uh, Sharon Ellison model. Sure. For sure. You can't predict who's going to get called on next. There you go. Keeps our brains supple, right? Um, so uh, I don't have a lot of comments. My biggest, um, I actually think the height fits nicely into this transition zone that the design experience guidelines and the district plan discuss. Um, but I am um, curious as to the the orientation of the building. I know Mick Johnson had um, kind of suggested maybe flipping it around the other way. I assume that would then call for access from 70th Street. Um, and part of the reason I say that is I think that this, this um, this leg of Valley View between 69th and 70th there could end up being part of our kind of Western promenade. And we've, you know, we've had a, not long ago, we had a, a review of um, a potential project from 6600 to 6800 France, which also backs on to um, Valley View Road as well. And so, um, and I, I, I'm being consistent by suggesting we try to kind of create a boulevard feeling there as opposed to um, a more car centric feeling. And so that's the reason that I'd like to see us explore the possibility of orienting the building in a way that puts the parking behind it instead of along that Valley View corridor. And there's a real opportunity there. It's not quite as wide as it is once you turn the corner at 69th, but um, but I, I, I'd be interested in your, in your thoughts on that. Otherwise, I think it's a, you know, what you're doing is a nice looking building. And, and I think the scale fits very nicely and the use fits very nicely in this particular zone and is consistent with the district plan and the design experience guidelines. Thank you, Member Stoughton. Um, let's go to uh, Member Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, Mr. Min, I want to, uh, I want to congratulate you on your thinking here. Um, I, there has been, I heard discussion earlier. I, I read Mick Johnson's, uh, uh, notes. Um, but I concur with your perspective on access from Valley view onto that site. Uh, over time, 
70th will become very busy. And uh, you, I mean, the nature of your residence will entail, you're going to have more calls. You just do. And so uh, access in, if it were from 70th, would be difficult. And potentially even, um, it, 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 you could create a, a dangerous situation on occasion. So I, I think emergency access in from Valley View uh, solves all those problems for you. Um, buildings of this nature, in my experience, um, you have visitors. You have adult children, uh, you, especially weekends. Um, there's going to be traffic there as well. So I think, again, bringing it off Valley View makes sense to me. Um, I'm sensitive to uh, Member Staunton's comments on uh, the boulevard or creating a boulevard experience here. Uh, at the same time, in, in looking at your plans, uh, I think you've been um, very thoughtful about stormwater management here uh, and how you handle that and still bring the buildings forward um, uh, is something to think about. Um, it's a point and something to think about. Um, uh, if you did that, uh, then again, access to the building becomes that that draws a question mark around that. Um, so, uh, the and opening, uh, by the way, in my opinion, to the west, really, I think, invites interface. Uh, you know, from the residential neighborhood, uh, I, I don't find that uh, isolated at all. Uh, I'm, uh, the residential neighborhood, the Cornelia neighborhood, doesn't need to look at a wall, and so I think that's um, that's very useful as well. Um, my 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 only real concern, and I, I was kind of surprised that Mick Johnson didn't note it in his comments. Uh, I, I heard uh, your civil engineer touch base briefly uh, earlier on on the uh, the West Seventieth uh, setback. Uh, I think I did. Um, and and what I note here uh, is as we address walkability of the project and into the community. The only north-south access is is that one. Uh, this whole area is limited uh, in terms of north-south access. Your residents, if if they were to walk, would would they, they won't be going on to 66th. They, they, they will come over 70th. They have to, um, and so that setback. And I know that's you know you're 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 pressing the limit here on the site itself. I understand. Uh, there's quite a bit of support in the community and from this body on this project. Uh, and so I, we're, we're trying to get units in there. Um, but I, it, I would love to see more attention given to that and how that becomes more walkable and more accessible. I mean, your own illustration shows a resident with a walker and a resident and a walker in December uh, with snow management along 70th with tra I, you know, I, I just think you'll want to think about that a little bit more. Um, I'm not as concerned about the uh, the east uh, uh, facing wall. I know that's a lot of units. I know it faces the parking lot. To me, um, that is a, a reasonable concession to get the quality of the development, and especially if we can find a way to to you know create a, a, a better setback on 70th that that to me is a good trade-off um and you know, we don't know what will happen there ultimately uh on the on the north side on the east side of that so there could be something a lot different there in 10 years we don't know so um there's that let me see if i had anything else the building materials are pretty much as you as you picture them i presume so um that i think could be very dramatic actually uh, you've got a 55, I heard uh, from Ms. Danfield, you've got a 55 uh, limit there, so that's that's good. I, I expect in your experience, Ms. Danfield, that you find that your residents are actually somewhat older uh, than the 55. 55 is an entry. Do you use 62 ever in, in your projects? We do. It depends on the type of financing that we have for a project. Sometimes... Um, you know, with with HUD financing, we're limited um, to certain age restrictions. We appreciate when we have an opportunity to open up our housing to a wider um, age range of of um, those, of older people. 
Um, it just makes for a more vibrant community. That said, I would say, you know, our average age is higher than the 55, certainly, um, in our uh, senior affordable buildings, um, you know, which again, um, they're higher, but the, we will not be providing healthcare services as part of the program for the building. So it is really for, um, you know, independent um, seniors. How do you address congregate dining? Um, we will not be providing congregate dining At all? Dining here. Catering? Nothing? Okay. We have not looked at that, no. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, uh, I guess last comment um, is uh, the the idea of, um, I, I guess it would be visually at least, public art on your southwest corner. That's a, that's a very, very good idea. Um, that becomes so visible in the roundabout and the traffic that will be going uh, especially uh, east uh, on 70th. I think that's a great idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Member Anderson. Uh, let's go to uh, Member Pierce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, next time, you know, we'll have to let you guys go first because you don't seem all that excited about your project. <laughs> so... Um, I'm excited about it. I think uh, you guys have done a, a nice job. Um, I applaud you um, in your use of the guidelines. Um, I like the idea that you're thinking about um, other activities that you can provide within the community. Um, I just had a couple of, of thoughts and I'm sure that you consider these. Um, so this is, I'm going to give you some feedback from uh, some uh, seniors in our community and things that um, they have expressed that would be important to them. Um, and one of those, um, it's great that it's 100% affordable and um, um, geared towards that senior community. However, uh, lots of our seniors have expressed that uh, they would prefer like multi-generational living. Um, and so this thought that, that your vitality uh, comes from having a mix of age groups within the same community. Um, and so um, if there, I'd ask you to, to maybe think about uh, ways to accomplish that, even if all of the units are senior units, when you think about um, other activities, things like that. Um, is there a way to bring uh, a flavor of vitality from um, using a multi-generational approach? Um, this one I thought was kind of funny. My wife and I were talking about this uh, the other day. The 80% um, of your uh, units are single bedroom. Um, and so I, you know, we have three daughters. And I said to my wife, uh, you know, when we move to senior living, um, we just need a condo with one bedroom. And she looks at me and says, well, that's not going to work. We have three children. Where are they going to stay? And I said, we'll pick a condo that's close to a hotel. <laughs> but clearly, um, she's thinking 80% single bedroom. While I understand why you have that, um, at, that as your highest occupancy, um, I do think uh, maybe thinking about having two bedrooms um, or the idea that you talked about having um, a guest house or a guest unit um, would be um, something that I think is a, a very uh, creative idea. Um, and then the last thing I would, would mention, um, we as a council, we talk quite a bit about issues of flooding um, storm water management. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that if, um, you can find a way to abate the issues of, of impacting the residential or the single family home neighborhood to the West of how you're going to be able to manage water and maybe potentially ease, uh, issues for the single family homes. Um, uh, to the west of the building, that actually would be a plus, right? It'd be awesome to have a developer come in and say, this is the 
this is the project that we're going to do. And oh, by the way, here are benefits for those residents that are living in that area and be able to list those. And one of the top ones that we talk a lot about is um, our management of, of uh, wastewater and trying to manage that particular issue. Um, and so I, with that, um, oh, I, I did have one other um, question. Um, if I, I lived, if I'm looking at your site map, your site plan um, uh, to the west of the, your building, I think that is uh, South Dale Road. And so if I lived in one of those houses uh, that backs up to Valley View, what would be my um, experience if I'm sitting in my backyard on the deck? Uh, what would be my experience with your building uh, being completed? And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll yield back my time. All right, thanks, Member Pierce. Yep. Um, I don't know if uh, Mr. Min, anybody wants to answer that question about uh, sight line for somebody living over on South Hill Road towards your building. And, I, and I'll, I'm gonna make a comment about that when it gets to be my turn. But. Sure, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, Council Member Pierce, I appreciate the, uh, the comments. Um, I would say that uh, once we complete the elevations and we come back for a formal application, we'll do uh, axiometric views from the west looking east so you'll get a perspective. The current office building, even though it's uh, it's effectively three stories, uh, what those neighbors now see. So we would be only slightly higher uh, on the west side and we'd be actually lower than what they see on the west side. That's the whole purpose of what we call this current design, we would refer to it as a letter J. Uh, so we think it would be equal to or less imposing uh, for residents from the West. Uh, and I don't know if you want me, Mr. Mayor, to comment on the other questions or we wait till the end when we have some feedback. Uh, maybe I'll just answer just that one question for the moment. All right, thank you. Thank you. Right, yeah, we can certainly do that. And then um, we'll go to Member Jackson next. Terrific, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to, this is a very exciting project and, and I'm really, I love the team you've put together and this is really neat. But if you could, Mr. Mann, if you could go back to that picture, actually I actually have a question for Mr. Teague, for Director Teague on this. Um, we've talked about a Western promenade and I was trying to go through the plans, figuring out where it would go. It looks kind of like uh, in the Southdale Experience Guidelines, it would go where Southdale Pet Hospital is now, kind of behind those buildings. But is this uh, idea of a Western Promenade just completely up in the air now with no um, uh, particular spot lo uh, identified yet? Yeah, there's no specific location. When we were contemplating development of this full block from France to Valley View, um, north and south, we contemplated it running through the middle of this block. Uh, but that said, it could be along Valley View Road, uh, somewhat similar to what Council Member Staunton was talking about. So there's not a set in stone. This is where it's to be. It'll kind of depend on as development goes. Okay. All right. Well, if if it's possible to preserve then a sense of boulevard along Valley View Road, um, I think with the rain gardens, you've got that kind of going. Um, so that's good. The other question I had for you was um, to go to off of M Member Anderson's comments. If you've got the picture of the front door, I can't exactly see how people will leave the building and then walk towards France Avenue. Um, I see a sidewalk by that white car there, um, but I'm a little concerned that there's an awful lot of parking lot and how you get out to the sidewalk. We see people walking there, um, but I wanna make sure that this is fully walkable. Um, so at the front door, how do you get to the sidewalk? I think if we put the site plan up <clears throat> instead of the elevation, there's, there's an interior sidewalk and there's a portico share that's attached to the building. So there's a pathway you can see. Zach, okay. you can move the cursor and just show the pathway. So to the north of the parking lot there, the 
Okay. Okay. That's that. I didn't, couldn't understand if that was the sidewalk. That's great. Okay. So you've got two sidewalks really yes. um, that connect. Okay. So yeah, walkability is really important and it looks like you've gotten that. I just want to, again, um, thank you. And um, we've got um, Mr. Rosano. I love the use of natural light. I want to thank you specifically for that. I, I think that's such an important thing. Um, it makes the site cheerful and, and just uses this wonderful open space to light it. Uh, so thank you very much. And, and I'm excited about this. Thanks, team. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I think all of our council members have indicated uh, the level of enthusiasm in our community for the senior affordable housing project since the Edina uh, housing group. Uh, Housing Foundation found the property for sale. Uh, a couple of calls I've had from neighbors on Southdale Road were worried early on about the fact that you may have four stories on Valley View that they'd be sitting on their back patios looking at four stories, which is kind of the Mick Johnson version of of what uh, right. they were worried about and. I really think that you have it oriented the right way. I think the, the J concept open to Valley View is a soft transition to the single family neighborhood. I haven't uh, had anybody call me or write to me since you uh, had your meeting with the neighbors or they've seen these plans where you've got uh, the height moving from west to east to elevating as it goes east. And I also think it would be um, a little bit more dicey working with, you know, you think of Kinderbury Hill right to the east. If you tried to put the access to the building on the east, in addition to the problems that I think Member Anderson pointed out about access off 70th, now you're also coming in right next to the place where they're, they're full of preschoolers. And I just think that's a bad idea, too. So I, I didn't agree with Mick Johnson's comments at all. I thought it, you set it up exactly the way it would be most appealing to the neighborhood. Uh, yeah, you've got that surface parking in the front, but uh, to Member Anderson's point, too, I think there will be guests coming and going, visiting uh, friends and relatives there. And I think that's important to have that access. The rain gardens are a great uh, addition. Uh, to the uh, landscaping and also to the practicality of stormwater management. And I thought Member Pierce raised an interesting issue there in terms of how effective can we make these rain gardens and that underground system that you're going to use? What will be the impact? Uh, will it lessen the impact to the neighbors to the west on the other side of Valley View? Uh, will they have less stormwater to manage than they had from the ACA building? That's an interesting thought. Uh, you do have some long runs of, uh, of a single plane, I think, or near single plane. And I'd like to see you deal with that a little bit. I think the open part of the J facing west on those two arms, things are probably fine there. Uh, but on the Kinderbury Hill side, uh, where you've got a single plane running north to south, I'd like to see some more articulation there. And I think you'd be better served up by some more articulation on the north side and the south side too, especially as it faces 70th. I think you want that moving in and out a little bit. Uh, would you re would you tell me again what the materials are? Is it is it stone, glass, and metal? Is that what it is, Mr. Min? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's a combination of brick, architectural grade uh, metal, and uh, cement fiber, as well as the glass. Okay. All right. That's helpful. Because it sure looks good, you know, and, and I think to your point, you've tried to make uh, the buildings that are affordable, whether it's market uh, or whether it's uh, for uh, all age demographics or seniors, look like they're market rate housing. And I think you've done an effective job of that. And we want to make sure that we maintain those high material standards. Uh, the design work from Pulp is always good. Uh, and so, Mr. Rossanel, I would say you got a little challenge ahead of you in dealing with some of that single plane things. I'd like to, like to see some more articulation when you come back. The 118 units, I think, is a home run. Uh, and the way you configure them based upon funding, uh, availability, financing, and, um, and what you project in terms of use, I think that's fine. That's a market decision that you have to make. I thought Member Anderson made some really good points, too. Uh, this is kind of his world uh, and 
all in all, I think just uh, a great use of the property. You're off to a wonderful start, and I look forward to seeing what we uh, what we'll uh, have from you next. And then I think, Mr. Men, you had a couple of questions you wanted to answer. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for those uh, glowing comments. We appreciate the enthusiasm. Uh, obviously, our team is very excited. We we pursued this project with uh, vigor. Uh, I wanted to address Councilman Pierce's comments, uh, primarily from a financial perspective. It's hard to blend multi-generational uh, in, the, in the project itself and still maintain the kind of uh, age restriction. That's not really possible under the financing schemes in the Fair Housing Act. But we're a block away from Cornelia School and we're next door to a daycare. Intergenerational will be part of our programming. That's what we want to accomplish. And I want to assure you, Councilman Pierce, we will we will focus on that. That's that's something that we want to uh, achieve. We do that at some of our other campuses with Ecumen where we have more land to work with. We just have a very tight site here. And so we had to make some decisions based on what the Housing Foundation told us they needed. Uh, we had to concentrate on one class and that's senior. But programming wise, I think we'll fill the building with lots of young people. I think that'll be a touchstone of what we accomplish here. Uh, the other comment I wanted to make uh, was that uh, we have a C design in response to Mr. Johnson's comments, and we haven't shown it to you tonight because we haven't found anyone that really thinks it's a good idea for traffic or pedestrian safety. Uh, and I'm a smart enough salesman to stop while I've already got the sale, I guess. So I'm not going to argue to why we didn't you know, show you the C any more than just tell you it's more complicated for parking, it's more complicated for pedestrian access, and it hurts the cul-de-sac 70th connection at the roundabout in terms of uh, emergency vehicle access. So this was very purposeful, and we appreciate the feedback you're giving us on the endorsement of orienting to the West. Uh, we're excited about this. We're going to be back in front of you folks, uh, obviously, for the, uh, the formal application, but there's also going to be a financing component, and so it would be Remiss if I didn't mention to you that our financing plan uh, will require some city participation, but the way we've set this up with the unit count and the design, uh, it should be a pretty minimal ask. I think the bond markets and the tax credits are more robust now based on the most recent law. And that's good for this project. We can, with the age uh, limits that we have and the, uh, the dissemination of the brackets between 30% AMI all the way to 80%, we're funding a lot more for this project than most affordable projects do on our own. And that's good news for everybody. Thank you for your time tonight. And if you have more questions, we're happy to stand for it. Thank you, Mr. Mann. I, I forgot one comment I was going to make, and that was uh, for Ms. Stanfield. Uh, Ecumen's uh, reputation uh, precedes you here. And I think uh, uh, it's a nice partnership that we're seeing. And um, the possibility of having Ecumen here, we'll see how the the whole process goes, but the, the possibility of having Ecumen uh, managed and being a partner in a piece of property in Dinah is, a, is generally a nice thought. There's there's process ahead of us yet, as I say. Uh, we've got uh, um, preliminary and final plans to deal with, uh, and there will be people that have concerns that will need to be raised, but I think we all think you're off to a, a good start. This is not uh, a prejudging the matter in any way. None of us are doing that. We have a responsibility to the public that we serve to deal with this matter uh, in a uh, transparent and appropriate way, and we will do so. But I think you're, uh, it was nice to see your presentation this evening. Also, for those of you that are new to the council, uh, Member Pierce and Member Jackson, uh, we are... Um, pleased to have uh, two residents uh, in our community that were former Minneapolis City Council members. Denny Schulstead and Steve Mim uh, both chose to uh, take up residence in Edina. Now uh, a couple decades passed and uh, we're pleased to have them here as residents of our community. So that's another, just a little tidbit of information for everybody. <laughs> Thank you. All right, anything else folks? All right. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now we are on to correspondence petitions. Uh, has anything come in, Manager Neal or Clerk Allison, that we need to be mindful of? It has not. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor? 
Yes. On the um, advisory communication from the Energy and Environment Commission, um, I would like to move the question on their um, resolution that they brought forward or raise the question. Is that if you, if you wanted to move it, I'd second it. <laughs> I will move it. All right, let me get out of here and find it here. Okay. Oops, went too far. Be back in a minute. Maybe you want to just state the motion, Member Jackson. Yes, it's it's a resolution to support Clean Cars Minnesota, and as we are looking at, um, you know, having to fund flood mitigation, the urgency of addressing climate change continues to be front and center, and this is one way in which we can help show our community support for wanting to reduce emissions from um, transportation. All right, and it sounds it sounds timely as well because there are rules that are being taken up shortly. All right, I'm I'm there with you now. I see that the action requested is the approval of the resolution of support for the MPCA rulemaking to adopt the clean car standards. We had a motion from Member Jackson and a second from Member Staunton. Is there any further discussion? All right, roll call, please, with respect to the motion. Councilmember Anderson. Aye. Councilmember Jackson. Aye. Councilmember Pierce. Aye. Councilmember Staunton. Aye. Mayor Hovland. Aye. Uh, the resolution is adopted, and uh, we are now supporting the MPCA rulemaking. And we get reports on this at the tab from time to time. It's, it's uh, I think it's really essential uh, that we have a MPCA member on the tab to be able to report out on all the different things that they're working on. They're doing some very, very good work. They're doing some good work with the uh, settlement monies they got out of the Volkswagen litigation in terms of expanding the capacity for recharging electric vehicles uh, on a system throughout the state, uh, providing some funding for uh, uh, cleaner equipment, electric electrified school buses, uh, and other um, other work that they're doing with some of those monies that are coming in from time to time. I think it was forty million total. So, Member Jackson, yeah. thanks for making that motion. You and bet. I would I would note that just this weekend GM announced that their their plan is to go to tailpipe free emission by 2035 on all their vehicles. So this is going in the right direction. Well, you were in there early with them. We got two of them. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, we did get an aviation noise update. Uh, Manager Neal and I got it. I don't know, Manager Neal, if you circulated to council members or if you wanted to just report out on what uh, former mem former member Brindle sent to us. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I thought I would just give the report tonight, if that's uh, if that's okay. All right, please do that. Um, so this is uh, directly from uh, what do we call her now, Commissioner Brindle? No, we call her uh, Noise Oversight Committee member. <laughs> Knock member Brindle. Knock, knock. <laughs> the FAA heard from our represent representatives in Washington, D.C. that aircraft noise uh, concern is a top priority for Americans. And as a result, the FAA developed a survey uh, that tr tries to take into account what people are experiencing. Uh, the survey is designed to gain knowledge about aircraft noise and exposure and annoyance. It's a comprehensive survey. You can take the survey at the at the at the website for Mac Noise, which is Mac M A C Noise N O I S E dot com, MacNoise dot com. And the public comment period for that survey is open until March fifteenth. Uh, the Noise Oversight uh, Committee is scheduled to meet in uh, its next regular session is Wednesday, March seventeenth at one thirty p.m. The NAC will meet in special meeting on will meet have a special meeting on February 17th at 1:30 p.m. to discuss the survey and approve a letter from the NAC to the FAA about the survey, its processes, and its results. All right, Mike. and Manager Neal, if you hold on that last one, I'll report on that one. I've got another. I've got more detailed information on the appointment. Very good, and that's all, right. all I've got for the uh, noise uh, airport noise report. Okay, and I'll hold my comments for uh, uh, mayor and council comment. Any questions for Manager Neal? Man, why don't we circulate that to uh, all of our council members too? Or yeah. can... All right, thank you. Yep. Um, in case they want to uh, uh, get some of the dates and times or some of that information she provided for 
meetings. Uh, and then on to uh, council comments. And um, let's start with Member Anderson. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't have anything tonight. All right, very good. Member Sutton? The only thing I'd mention is picking up on um, the last item we dealt with on the on the clean cars business from a process perspective i think it'd be interesting maybe this is a topic that can squeeze into the retreat somewhere um from member pierce and member jackson about sometimes these advisory commission reports get kind of lost in that space and the commission thinks they're asking us to do something and we kind of sometimes don't see that they're asking us to do something. So I just want to make a note to kind of check in on that process issue at some point and think about if that's the best way to get them. I know we've had this discussion from time to time, but with a, with a new configuration of our council, maybe we should revisit it again. Sure. sure. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, this week we saw a story in the Star Tribune about um, solid waste in the metropolitan area. And the MPCA has re received four requests to um, increase landfilling. And so when we adopted uh, composting and co organics um, recycling here in Edina, some of the comments were, well, you can always expand and everything. But I wanted to highlight the, the importance of doing organics recycling because we're going to have to see some expanding landfills and there's an equity issue to that, uh, uh, environmental justice, which communities have to bear the brunt of our waste and, and stuff that's going into the ground. If it, we don't expand these landfills, it goes to either Wisconsin or Iowa, so our neighboring states are having to house our garbage. So there's a real cost to our solid waste um, uh, disposal. So I wanted to, um, it's, it's both when you use a landfill, there's greenhouse gas emissions and also the risk of groundwater contamination. They put linings in, but no linings are perfect. Um, it, the quote was, it oozes toxic fluids. So <laughs> it is uh, unpleasant. And so I, I wanna applaud um, the past city council for adopting organics recycling and encourage our residents to take advantage of this. We've got, um, we've put about 600 million, or 670 tons of, we've diverted from landfills into composting so far. So as far as numbers go, it's been very successful, very low rate of contamination. And now we've got smaller carts available for smaller households. Um, so we can uh, try and accommodate some of those houses that don't have much, um, garage space or, or anything, but we're trying to make it work. And I just want to encourage people to take a, advantage of this um, program because it's so important because uh, landfills are expensive, nasty, and, um, and costly to our environment and also to our pocketbooks. So thank you. Okay. Amber Pierce? Did we have any? Um, I, did, yep, I didn't have anything yeah, this okay. time, uh, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one thing for me, and that's a follow-up uh, on Mary Brindle's uh, report to us. We got notification. Uh, we had two Edina residents, actually maybe four Edina residents that had applied for uh, the position that uh, was held by Katie Clark Seaven uh, from Edina uh, as the commissioner for District C and the Metropolitan Airports Commission. Uh, none of those Edina folks were selected. The person selected is a guy named Jim Lawrence, who was a graduate of uh, Harvard and Yale uh, some years ago now. He was the executive vice president for Northwest Airlines, old Northwest Airlines for two years back in the 90s. Uh, he lives in Minneapolis now. Uh, he is the chair of Lake something called Lake Harriet Capital. It's a family-based investment office, and then he's also the non-executive chairman of something called Lake Harriet Development that does uh, technology-enhanced, well-focused, healthy living communities. So uh, he is going to be our new representative, and we will want to reach out to him and invite him to a council meeting and so we can meet him. And I will uh, send him an email. I got his contact information um, from the chair of the MAC. 
and we will uh, see if we can't get them to a council meeting in the near future to meet everybody. So uh, that's it for me, Manager Neal. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I have one thing tonight, and that is that we are uh, we are in the process of preparing our uh, 2021 quality of life survey, and part of that process is to is to let uh, elected officials know, let the five of you know that we are ready to kind of hear your ideas um, of of what you want to know uh, from this survey. The survey is uh, about three quarters to two thirds kind of standardized questions uh, that we that we ask every year. So they're longitudinal questions. So we've, we're now building up a good uh, bit of data about how we're performing on standard questions from year to year. But somewhere between a third and 25% of the of the survey is a little different every year. And if you have some questions that uh, that you are interested in, um, please, this is the time to let us know that we, we want to firm up the the survey, uh, the survey content by the end of this month. Uh, we do have an upper limit in terms of the number of questions we ask. The longer the survey gets, the less uh, uh, households that really complete it and give us a full, uh, a full response. And I would ask you to, to, if you have ideas about questions, let me know what those are. But don't spend any time trying to write the question because the, the vendor, uh, Polco, uh, they they insist on writing the questions, so we will. If we know, if we get a sense of what you want to learn, uh, we can we can work with them to produce the questions that elicits those responses. And so I just want to give you that heads up and uh, let me know as as soon as you can. Thanks. All right, thank you, Manager Neal. Uh, that prompt any other thoughts from council members? All right. Some nice work tonight. Uh, it's, it's nice to see continuing interest in the city of Edina and uh, development opportunities uh, in our community. So is there a motion? Mr. Mayor. Sure. Yes, Mr. Mr. Mayor. I, you know, I, I, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't make this comment. Um, it really would be nice if on our Edina MN.gov website that we would recognize that it's Black History Month. Um, and so we could, the uh, city has done a lot over the past year um, to recognize uh, some of the social, uh, social economic and racial issues. Um, it'd be really nice to have something up there to just recognize that. That's a wonderful thought for Pierce. I think our council would agree with you. So I'll take care of that. Andrew Neal, can we do that? You bet. Right, let's get something up there. Is there any special uh, sites that you've seen, man, uh, Member Pierce, anything in particular that we need to make sure that we get on there that's a, a link to some other organization or organizations? Um, no, you know, I, I, there are some things out there. Um, what I can do is tomorrow morning, I'd be happy to connect with uh, uh, Manager Neal um, on that. Okay. Or our yeah. director Benarat too, I think. Either. Our director Benarat, yeah. We have been Jen Jennifer and her team have been working on uh, kind of standardizing the way that we recognize some of our more notable holidays and, yeah. and events that we commemorate and and recognize. So this is part of that process, so that we have them ready to go, and and we have some Black History Month uh, events and and. Uh, uh, recognitions that we are going to do, and uh, so you'll be seeing more of that coming up. Awesome. Yeah. Member Pierce, I'm so grateful for you bringing that up. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Anything else from members? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We get a motion from Member Jackson and a second from Member Pierce to adjourn the meeting of the United City Council on February 2nd, 2021. Any further discussion? Roll call, please, with respect to the motion. Clerk Allison? Councilmember Jackson? Aye. Councilmember Pierce? Aye. Councilmember Staunton? Aye. Councilmember Anderson? Aye. Mayor Hufflin? Aye. We stand adjourned. Good night. Good evening, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you.